Dia of Accordia, I'm Adrian O'Neill, Ireland's Ambassador to the United Kingdom, and I'm speaking to you from our embassy here in London. I'm delighted to welcome guests from the Irish Writers in London Summer School on the special occasion of its 25th anniversary this year. While we are unable to come together to celebrate this milestone occasion with you all in person, we're still excited and honoured to commemorate the rich history, literary contribution and cultural significance of the Summer School in this virtual way. For the past quarter century, the Irish Writers in London Summer School has showcased some of the very best Irish writing and welcomed a high calibre of guest writers and educated students about Irish literature. The first summer school took place in 1996 under the stewardship of Dr Tony Murray, who I am pleased to welcome here today. Since then, more than 90 different writers have participated across a range of genres, including Edna O'Brien, Bernard Donoghue, Morris Leach, Shane Connachton, Anne Devlin, and many others. In the context of a very challenging last year, we've seen how the standard media of culture have changed, and cultural groups and organisations have adapted to remain relevant. It has never been more important that organisations like the Irish Writers in London Summer School continue to share Irish culture and literature with those who have an interest and who are eager to learn more, to experience it and to enjoy it. I wish to commend this wonderful organisation and its founder Tony Murray for its indelible contribution to Irish literature, history and culture in Britain over many years. I'm delighted to have Professor Don MacRailed, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor of London Metropolitan University, also here this evening. And I thank the university for hosting the summer school over many years. The Irish Embassy has been a proud patron of the Irish in Britain archives at London Metropolitan University. And the visit by President Higgins to the university's Irish Studies Centre in 2016 reflects the cultural and historical significance of the archive for the Irish community in Britain. The Embassy is also glad to support the Archives Digitisation Project, which was officially launched in March of 2020. I'm also very happy to welcome back to the Embassy the Summer School's patron, the poet Martina Evans, and this evening's special guest, author Lucy Caldwell. Martina recently published a collection of her poetry, American Mules, and Lucy's novel, These Days, is being published next spring. Of Ireland's 11 Nobel laureates, four have received prizes for literature. William Butler Yeats, George Bernard Shaw, Samuel Beckett, and of course, the late Seamus Heaney. To draw on the words of one of these laureates, W.B. Yeats, he once said that, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And the Irish writers in London summer school has lit that fire for people young and old over the past 25 years. I'm confident it will continue to do so for the next 25, and I congratulate the school for everything it's achieved, and thank you all for joining in this evening's celebration. Guramil Mahagav Galair. The Vice-Chancellor of London University are indebted to Ambassador O'Neill for hosting this event. Thank you, Ambassador. We're also extremely uh, grateful to the Irish Government for their continued support over the years for Irish studies at our institution. This isn't the first time we've all been together in a room to mark our shared vision. I remember the very week before COVID sent us all into our home offices in March 2020 that we gathered together to launch the Irish in Britain archive at Oldgate, our Oldgate campus. Uh, this was a resource made available to ordinary people of, of uh, the community, which would not have been possible had it not been for support from the Irish government and from the embassy. So gratitude for that as well. Today we're marking what we consider to be the latest milestone in our commitment to continuing education. Now I'm an historian, not a literary scholar. I work on the 19th century Irish diaspora, not the 20th century, but my people are the forebears of those who today 
represent the London Irish. My people, the ones I study from the 19th century, invested their later generations, their sons and grandsons, their, their daughters and granddaughters, with the culture of their homeland. And those communities that came after the great waves of migration in the 19th century and continued through the 20th, these people retain a passion for their history, for their literature, and for their genealogy. They're just the kinds of people who may have signed up at any point in the past 25 years to study on this summer school at London Metropolitan University. Now, not all descendants of the Irish in Britain want to remember their past in Ireland, but millions do. And this summer school is for them and it's about them, but it's also curated by one of them, our own Dr. Tony Murray. Tony's hugely well-received book, London Irish Fictions, captures the interplay between the diaspora, Irish writers, and their literary culture. It's an excellent book, which is very, very, widely, very, very widely appreciated. Tony himself personifies Fintan O'Toole's elastic paddy, the durability of that identity over time through generations. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Tony, and we owe him a great debt of gratitude. Thank you, Tony. But our individual efforts and our collective efforts are nothing compared to the most important fact that this summer school represents in focus the long living connection and durable relationships between our two islands. Going to the summer school was something I look forward to every single year that I've been going. I just love it. I just love it to bits, I really do. <laughs> For centuries, London has had a profound influence on the imaginations of writers and readers. This has particularly been the case for those who have migrated here from elsewhere. For the Irish, coming to London has been a recognisable yet often unsettling experience. Bobby Gilmore, who worked with Irish migrants in London in the 1980s, observed that the psychological journey of migration always takes far longer than the geographical one. Migration has informed Irish people's perceptions of themselves for centuries. Nowhere is this more evident than in the country's literature. The conflicts of cultural identity that migration sometimes provoke have provided the inspiration for countless writers. Since it began in 1996, the Irish Writers in London Summer School has invited over 100 of them to discuss their work. I absolutely love the summer school. The writers that come, the visiting writers, are of the highest calibre. I studied English literature at university, so I was used to studying writers and writing, um, but the chance to actually get to speak to the writers after you've studied it is uh, incredible. The first summer school took place at a time of great optimism for Ireland. The economy was booming, and the green shoots of the peace process had begun to emerge. River dance had gone global. Irish theme pubs abounded. And Seamus Heaney had recently been awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. Here in Britain, Irish studies was thriving and London Metropolitan University was renewing its historical mission to broaden access to underrepresented groups in the community. The summer school runs for five and a half weeks. There's no assessment and no prior qualifications are required to enrol. Students meet twice a week, firstly on a Tuesday to discuss a set text with each other and the tutor, and again on a Thursday to continue the conversation with the author. It's a bit like with um, the format for Top of the Pops of such a strong format. It ran for years and years and years because nobody tinkered with it. And I think the format of the summer school is brilliant. You've got such a variety of people coming along and everybody's so interesting and they love literature and... I just really enjoy that. Extremely enjoyable. It really was, I mean, almost kind of uniquely so my experience, those gatherings, because they're a wonderful mixture of highly informed and enthusiastic. The thing that it most reminded me of to, to compare with is the, um, the Sligo Yates Summer School. My involvement with the Summer School has hugely contributed to my life as a writer. 
I was very drawn always towards the London Irish community, so it was very exciting for me to actually meet them. You kind of came in off the road, off Holloway Road, and then you heard all these Irish accents and so many stories. So many of their own stories came out as they talked. They're also very forthright, the students. That's the other thing about them. They don't hold back. They're very honest. I think the summer school is unique, and I think a lot of that's down to Tony Murray, who organised it. Edna O'Brien joined us for our 10th anniversary. Her visit happened to coincide with Bloomsday, and I recall a distinct joyce and echo when she said to the students, how could I have written about Ireland if I had stayed? My daughter was 14 and she just read The Country Girls and she asked Edna a question. And um, I think it made lead on my daughter's evening because when we had to leave early, um, Edna blew her a kiss. I also remember Polly Devlin. She was another writer that I saw and I thought she was outstanding as well. My first book was a complete lament for my Irishness, an utter threnody for what I had lost. And where was I? And what was the camouflage? And where did I go? And so in a way, the Irish summer school was a pivot point for me. I began to write more freely about my Irishness. And I think that's why I loved the summer school, that this was an enabling bridge. Ronan Bennett, he came on the very first summer school in 1996. And afterwards, I remember he said how the session had actually contributed to the completion of his third novel. I also recall very well the visit of the poet Michael Donaghy. When he came into the room, he sat down, put his hand in his bag and pulled out a flute and began to play us a jig. Then he recited a poem called The Reprieve about the Chicago police chief Francis O'Neill, who used to collect tunes from the prisoners in his custody. As the poem illustrates, he let them go if they could play a tune he'd never heard before. From its earliest days, the majority of guest writers have been women. Emma Donoghue, Anne Devlin and Kate O'Reardon were all early guests. The range of genres featured has also expanded over the years, from fiction, poetry and drama, to memoir and history, to blogging, journalism and children's books. I think in particular Lucy Cordwell had come when we worked with one work and then she came back later it was another work and you could see a massive development in her as a writer and that was really interesting i've come to discuss a radio play short stories a novel it's always very interesting especially when you have participants who've been there on prior occasions who know your work across different forms i found that really valuable one of the things that I love about the summer school is the deep familiarity that the participants have with your work. When you come in, the questions that they ask are really searching and they allow you to give. I've sometimes surprised myself with the answers that I've been able to give about my work because you're not asked generic questions. The course has always featured writers from different religious traditions in Ireland. It has also hosted LGBTQ plus writers and authors from mixed ethnic heritage too. An Irish Nigerian writer, Gabriel Badamosi, grew up in London, left a big impression on me. He was one of those people in the summer school as a writer who attended, who shows you and introduces you to a different kind of Irishness than existed in my youth 50 years ago in Ireland. I found a great, a great range of people, N not the people you'd find in normal academic university kind of contexts, but people who are interested in Ireland, in London, and in writers. Looking like me, sounding like me, it might be a bit odd, but it's a kind of, it's a gap that people in Ireland have needed to jump over in order to grasp their own history, in order to empathetically connect with what happened to all those people who left. What I met in the summer school was everything I'd hoped for, but the summer school recognised me as Irish without me having to gently induct them into my Irishness. It was a given. By prioritising writers based here, the summer school has promoted the voices of second-generation Irish authors. 
The stand-up comedian and travel writer Pete McCarthy came in 2002. He demonstrated how complex questions of Irish identity could be dealt with in both a thought-provoking and humorous way. His mother had failed to spot the bottle of Pachin. <laughs> the same was true of John Healy, another second-generation writer who first came in 1997. It was a good evening, a great evening. The students were quite witty and putting questions that made me laugh. Later, after wine, the students started telling stories that might have put Dickens to shame. Uh, it, might, it could have been the Irish blood in them, or the wine, or else the Irish uh, writing school's expert tuition. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> The extracurricular side of the course is amazing, it's brilliant. We get to go to some plays and uh, guided walks. After each session with the, the writers, there's an option to go across the road to a, a nice uh, restaurant over there and have some food and drinks with your fellow students, with Tony and with the writer. Over the years I've seen uh, students from the Irish Writers Summer School come back themselves as guest writers, visiting writers, and that's always really, really thrilling. By the time the summer school ends, you just wanted to, to keep going, you know, it's just, uh, and you think, oh, I've had to wait another 12 months for next year's summer school. Irish literature is currently going through another renaissance, and some of its leading new names have once again chosen London to advance their careers. On a warm summer's evening in 2019, Ema McBride came to talk about her novel, The Lesser Bohemians. The chance to discuss a piece of literature, to discuss a text uh, written by somebody like Ema McBride, who is one of my, my favourite writers, with Ema McBride herself uh, is, is an absolute treat. In his poem, Digging, Seamus Heaney draws parallels between the physical labour of farm work and the mental labour of writing. This duality acquires an added meaning in relation to Irish migration. The manual contribution of migrant Irish workers has historically been complemented by the artistic achievements of Irish writers abroad. Writers continue to use the pen to dig into their memories and imaginations, unearthing and reshaping what it means to be Irish today. By connecting readers with authors, the Irish Writers in London Summer School provides a unique space in which to explore, interrogate and celebrate contemporary Irish writing. I hope you enjoyed the film. You'll see from the credits that I dedicated the film to a man called Barry Baker. Barry was uh, an English TV writer and producer and was most famous for creating the popular TV series No Hiding Place. It was the line of duty of its day in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And I was fortunate to have Barry as a personal tutor years later when I studied film and TV production in Manchester. Although I never became a TV scriptwriter myself, I, I learned a great deal from the many hours I spent talking to Barry about writing, and in particular about what made writers tick. The longer I've done the summer school, the more I appreciate the value of those formative conversations. They form the bedrock of the approach I take today with Irish writers on the summer school. Barry didn't have a drop of Irish blood in his veins, but he had a deep affection for Ireland. He worked as a consultant for the establishment of Televisieren in the early 1960s. 
He died many years ago, but he left me a great legacy, and I very much feel his spirit and instinct for what makes good writing today. The celebration we're having this evening wouldn't have been possible without the commitment and support of certain people. First and foremost, I want to thank the Ambassador Adrian O'Neill for hosting the event this evening. I'd like to thank his team here at the Embassy, in particular Rachel Ingersoll and Nicola Murphy. At London Met, I'd like to thank Professor Don McCrail and Professor Mary Hickman for their support over the years with the Summer School. My colleagues, Maiva Kashve and Anna Kamek also, for their expert administrative support with the Summer School. Our patron, the poet, Martina Evans, who has been a valued supporter of the Summer School in so many different ways from its inception. And I'd also like to thank Martina's predecessor, Polly Devlin. I want to express my gratitude also to my partner, Joanne O'Brien, for her expertise with making the film, but also for indulging my obsession with the summer school every year for over two decades now. Finally, and most important of all, I want to thank the wonderful writers and students over the last 25 years who are what it's all about. They've made the summer school what it is today. And it's to one of those writers I'd like to turn now our special guest for this anniversary, Lucy Caldwell. But first, she is going to read for us from a new collection of short stories entitled Intimacies. I'm going to read from the penultimate story in my new collection. The story is called Devotions. And as I was writing it, I was thinking of Nick Laird's beautiful line, time is how we spend our love. It's a story of a car journey back from the Yorkshire Dales into London with a very young family and it was my attempt to make something sacred out of the very quotidian. So I'm going to read four short extracts. You loaded the car and set the sat-nav, the thin, twisting roads through the dales that would become carriageways, then motorways, as if impelled by the journey's own momentum. Driving up on Boxing Day, you'd been amused by the road signs heralding the north, as if it were a place rather than a concept, something not relative, but real. You missed your own North then, and your once ritual walk around the deserted, expectant city centre streets on Christmas morning, the lingering skies of a city salved from sleet and ruled by water. At the unlikeliest times, you felt the tug of it, like the twitch of a dousing rod. You'd never imagined you'd be calling London's grimy East End home. The snow began to fall on the outskirts of Doncaster as the A1M became the A1 and then the M18, the first signs for the south somehow less beguiling. Past Sheffield and Chesterfield, Nottingham, Grantham, the heartlands of this country you barely know at all. Birmingham is the Midlands and Peterborough the hinge between north and south. But despite your years here, you would struggle to place them on a map. The voice of the satnav, set half as a joke, to a Northern Irish accent. The accent in places is meant to be as close as English gets to the way that Shakespeare spoke it. The quirks and rhythms of the planters, the Tudor noblemen given swathes of land, forbidden from marrying or even employing the dispossessed, preserved in certain pockets for centuries. Continue straight ahead. The closer you get to home, the slower the roads are, the last couple of miles done at a crawl. There is no snow in London, just the dank residue of slush against the curbs, bin bags and cardboard boxes piled up on the pavements, already the occasional yellowing Christmas tree. Through Poplar and the East India Docks, Limehouse and Stepney on the commercial road, once Orchard Lane, then a brickfield, earlier than that, a series of the East End's deepest plague pits, Public houses and stables, market gardens and music halls, the Blitz, a scrappy park frequented by local alcoholics and flocks of belligerent pigeons, named after a young Saleti clothing worker stabbed to death, syringes among the ancient, weathered slabs of gravestone in the corner by the takeaways extractor fans. Home, you think, 
as Zeno's paradox. Motion is impossible, change an illusion. The arrow is neither moving to where it is, nor where it is not, and therefore St. Sebastian never died. Zeno of Elia, Plato in his cave, Aristotle, Socrates with his cup of hemlock. The years you spent studying them, trying to shape your mind to think like them. Lately, all they said seems meaningless, or at least irrelevant. Now, you wonder if they ever gazed at a newborn's face and felt the world tilt and fall away. Watched a child grow up and felt the panic of time. Motion is not impossible, in fact the opposite. Life rushes by, streams through the attempt to snatch at it, then suddenly parts to show you glimpses of the next world and the next, the ceaseless change to come. The dales seem a lifetime away. Just this morning, clambering up to see the ponds brimming with winter rain, the blank trees around them, not even yet imagining their leaves. Your son, after a brave attempt to keep up with his cousins, wanting to be carried. Come back next summer, they'd said, and we can have picnics on the ridge. For a moment, you see your son, brown-legged and golden-haired, scrambling ahead, racing joyfully away from you. Maybe the baby too would be walking by then. The warm heft of her on your chest. Those lines by Keats come into your head. The sonnet at the very end of the battered A-level textbook, which was also, maybe, the last poem he ever wrote. Pillowed forever upon my sweet love's breast. No, that's not quite it, but you can't check now, so you let it pass. Nature, sleepless eremite. You remember the volta of that poem. But what if eternity does not mean endless time, but an escape from it? What if, from the perspective of eternity, time is a droplet, held together by its own surface tension, everything that had happened, or ever would, taking place simultaneously and already over? You think, then, of the children who flickered only so briefly in your body and in your mind, never met, never kissed, never held, yet held somewhere in the unfathomable depths and reach of love. The lives unlived, the loves yet not unloved. We get to choose in this life what is most holy, and we must do our best to honour it. The snow upon the mountains and the moors, the baby's breathing, this, this, this. So Lucy joins me now to discuss her new collection of short stories, Intimacies, and in particular her short story Devotions, which you heard her read earlier. Welcome Lucy. Thank you for having me. It's Such a uh, privilege to be here. You're very welcome. Um, I'm going to begin, if you don't mind, by um, asking some questions that my students sent me. Um, as you know, in the summer school the format is that the students read the work in advance and then ask questions of the writer on the Thursday evening, uh, two days after they've uh, discussed it in class. So I'm trying to replicate the same format here in a sense. They've read the story in advance. And uh, the first question I have is from Stephen Moran. And he asks, why did you choose to tell the story in the second person? And how do you find readers react to that particular viewpoint? Stephen, thank you. That is such a good question. Um, your students always ask really good questions. So with the second person, four of the stories in my debut collection, Multitudes, were told in the second person. And similarly, in Intimacies, four of the stories, four of the eleven are second person. Mm -hmm. And it's a viewpoint that I find really interesting. It's a very tricky viewpoint sometimes to pull off, mm -hmm. because I think in some circumstances it can seem really haranguing and readers sometimes mm -hmm. react against that by being told who they are and what they should be thinking, what they yeah. should be feeling, where they are. But I came to use the second person narrator in Multitudes and then again in Intimacies as if the reader was privy to a conversation that the mm. protagonist or the character was having with himself. So I wanted the reader to have the sense that sometimes they can't even breathe. They're witness to something, they're overhearing something. Maybe that's between the character and the voice in their head that's narrating something, mm. or maybe it's between the protagonist and a future version of their self. Mm. Um, it changes from story to story, but in this 
piece. It's not, it's one of the more autobiographical pieces in mm -hmm. the collection. Mm -hmm. I wanted this story, Intimacies is dedicated to my daughter, and I really wanted to capture and make something sacred of some of that work of early motherhood, early parenthood. Mm. I was thinking about mothers being artists and writers, and I was thinking of the pram in the hallway, mm. and I was trying to make something sacred out of that mundane. And so with this, the second person is very intimate, and it's the sense of someone, a narrator who's very close to me, um, talking to themselves, talking themselves through this journey. Thank you. That's, uh, that's very clear. Um, and it's a notoriously difficult form, the second person, isn't it, to pull off, but I think you achieve it brilliantly, if I may say so. Thank you. It's something to do with the rhythms. And, yeah. I think, Stephen, your question asked about how do readers react. And I mm. think with this one, I want them to almost not notice. I want them to let the rhythms of the story take over. And it's a story in which I think an I narrator, you know, the first person, would have started to seem too obtrusive. It would have started to seem a character piece um, mm. when that's not what I wanted. So I would hope that the reader almost is lulled, um, loses the mm. sense of, of mm. the narrator, mm. is right there with right. The, 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 the you protagonist as they're making this journey. Yeah. Well, I suppose in that sense, it's a very intimate engagement with the reader, isn't it? It's very appropriate in that sense, in terms of the title. In terms well. of the title, exactly. Um, the second question is from a student called Ethel Corduff, and um, it touches on something you've already mentioned. Uh, she asks, how autobiographical is this story exactly? Thank you, Ethel. Um, as I've said, this is quite an autobiographical story. With the stories and intimacies, I wanted to find a way of writing at an emotional pitch that felt true, that felt vulnerable, that felt raw, um, even when the stories themselves weren't necessarily autobiographical. Some of them are based on true stories. Um, some of them are based on things that happened to me. Um, I love the answer that Wendy Erskine always gives when she says, the heart knows things, you know, the heart right. kind of experienced yeah. things. Um, that maybe you haven't. With this story, I, I had recently read um, the stories of Lucia Berlin, who was a revelation to me. Her stories were collected posthumously um, in a volume by Picador called A Manual for Cleaning Woman. Mm -hmm. And there's a brilliant introduction by Lydia Davis, and Lydia mm -hmm. Davis quotes one of Lucia Berlin's sons, who says, Ma wrote true stories, not necessarily autobiographical, but close enough for horseshoes. And I love that, right. Close Enough for Horseshoes. Yeah. I thought Lucia Berlin was a real model to me for how you can use the stuff of your life mm -hmm. and how you can write really close to the bone. And with this story, it was based on a journey that my husband and I did make driving back from the Yorkshire Dales, where we'd been visiting some of his family, um, when our children were very small. And it was a journey that I wanted to capture. Um, this, the journey itself was a bit more dramatic than the story in the book in that we were driving late and frazzled and slightly deprived of sleep and took an exit from the motorway which wasn't actually an exit. The car had to come slamming to a halt when we realised the road ran out. Both children woke up and started crying. We had whiplash. Wow. Funnily, when I wrote that into the story, I thought I might do something with yeah. that closeness of mortality, which is elsewhere in the collection. Yeah. But something about the rhythm and the pace of the story, that would have destabilised it. It was, yeah. it was unnecessary, it was too melodramatic. And what the story wanted is some of the sense of the Keats poem that it quotes. Um, bright star, yeah. bright star, where I were steadfast as thou art, yeah. um, not in lone splendour, hung aloft the night. You know, I wanted some of that slowness and steadiness and that sense of a journey existing outside of time, the way that quite often journeys do, you know, planes, trains, buses, mm. long car journeys. Mm. And so, yes, it's a version, it's a version of something that happened to me, but something alchemical happens when you put it in fiction on the page. A transformation happens, even with stuff that's very, very autobiographical, yeah. I think. Mm. Um, the third question is from Bernadette O'Connell. And uh, she asks, uh, there seems to be multiple possible meanings to the title. 
uh, devotions. And she said, um, was this deliberate? Was this something that you'd uh, planned or was it something that um, evolved as, you, as the, as the uh, story is completed? Yeah, the story from its inception, mm -hmm. it was going to be called Devotions. Mm -hmm. Because of this notion that I had, I wanted to lift this quotidian life. Mm -hmm. I, want, I had the Keats poem was one of the ingredients from the start as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that sense of um, the waters performing their priestly ablutions on the earth and the sense mm -hmm. of devotion, the sense of hermit, a sense of to what do you give your life? To what do you devote your mm -hmm. hours, your days, your minutes? Um, and so the title was always there. I think often with titles, sometimes they're there from the start. Sometimes they're an intrinsic part of how you mm. conceive and how you layer the story. Mm. Um, sometimes titles don't come till the very end. Sometimes titles mm. conceal. Um, sometimes titles intrigue or they reveal. But with this title, it's very much, um, I don't know, it's like in, in the rock, in the candy cane of the story. Mm. It's, it's right there running all the way through. And I wanted mm. all those multiple religious meanings, those, those, that, I wanted that way of thinking about early motherhood, early parenthood. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, so that kind of variety that you've talked about in relation to Louis McNeese's work and that somehow seems to come through in terms of just the title yes, alone. Yes, exactly. In that story. And it was, it was very important yeah. that the title is Devotions Plural. Yeah. Um, it's not devotion, it's not to any one thing. Yeah. It's mm. devotions as. The beautiful line from Nick Laird that I quoted um, mm. at the start of my reading, uh, time is how we spend our love. And I wanted that sense of um, being a parent is not even just necessarily the, the carrying a child or the giving birth to a child, it's those quotidian minutes mm. and hours and days and the mm. repetition and the repetition of all the humdrum tasks. Mm. Um, the poet and writer Dira Nagriffa is brilliant on this as well, her book, I loved it recently, A Ghost in the Throat, and she talks of that book being a female text, mm -hmm. and she talks about, you know, motherhood in a similar, similar right. way. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. The final question uh, yes. is from Joan Minogue, and uh, Joan asks, I was struck by the line about tying being like a droplet uh, from the perspective of eternity. Um, was this the conceptual driver for the story. Yeah, uh, Tony, you always, your students <laughs> read so keenly and they read so perceptively. It's just a joy for a writer to be read as closely as it. Mm. And absolutely, it was. It, I had that idea. It took me, I think, months. I had this image in my head and it took me months and months and months to come up with the right words for that line. Mm. And that line, once I had it, I knew where it came in the story. I knew that the story was building there. And that there's another line, um, if I can find it in the story, um, towards the very end, um, we get to choose in this life what is most holy and we must do our best to honour it. That was another line that I wrote a version of the story that, that it was missing something, it wasn't quite working. And then I, I remember the place and time um, because I still have the note that pinned to my desk. I was at a literary festival in Dublin mm. and I woke up in the middle of the night with this line in my head, scribbled it down on a little pad, you know, beside the bed. And there was a line about time um, being a droplet, you know, and there was this line and there was an earlier line. And they were the moments that the story had mm. to what am I doing? They were, they were beads or they were, they were droplet. They were, they were the, the, the tones that that story had to hit. So, but that was the most important one. So, yeah. so yeah, thank you. It's fascinating hearing you talking about that inspirational moment as a writer and how it can be so fleeting mm -hmm. and how you manage, you know, as a good writer, when to listen and for me it's always about listening yeah. um it's always about rhythm um i grew up playing the violin i played suzuki violin from when i was about age four i played in youth orchestras all my life mm. and so for me it's always about the rhythm it's always about the way something sounds and i'm always listening to it you know and quite often mm. it's a particular frequency or a particular tone mm. that i want to 
that I want to get. You realise as a writer, you know, I, I'm terrible. I never know what people look like, my characters look like. I always feel them from the inside. I have no idea what they look like. Um, I'm terrible with metaphor, simile. You know, I'm not a very descriptive or baroque writer in that sense. But for me, it's it's the tone and it's um, mm. it's the, the the atmosphere that I'm trying to create that mm. that is something that I I test by by feeling and, and, and by seeing does it does it ring true? Right. And presumably, um, you know, for readers, that experience is somehow mirrored when they read your work. I mean, that ability to empathise. And um, I was very struck by this collection in terms of, you know, its subject matter, very much about motherhood mm -hmm. in all sorts of different forms. Um, I was blown away. Um, it made me feel like, you know, what a woman might feel like, you know. Um, but to manage to do that as a writer is, is, is incredible. Um, I just you. wondered, um, what your thoughts were about um, that relationship between the writer and the reader and how empathy or the exercise in empathy is somehow the connection between the two? That's such a good question. Um, one of the meanings of the title of the collection, which is Intimacies, um, if you take the verb form to intimate, it means to tell something as urgent as possible in as few words as possible, you know, to suggest something, to imply something, maybe something delicate, maybe something important. Mm. And I think there's a sense of that with the short stories, and my short stories mm. tend to be quite short, um, and they're more akin to poetry in that every line break, every comma, every punctuation, everything matters, everything needs to be carrying the meaning of the story. Mm. And especially with these stories, many of which is we've already talked about or told in the second person. I love the sense of when we, when we read a story, even when we read it on the page, we're hearing it, you know, there's a voice in our head mm. where we're hearing it. And I think some of, the, some of our first experiences with storytelling is being read to. Mm. You know, we mm. hear stories, yeah. Um, yeah. We, maybe we hear stories and lullabies um, at our mother's lap you know, our parents reading to us, our grandparents. And so I wanted that sense of that particular intimacy between the writer and the reader, maybe something akin to being read to or being akin to the, the voice in our head, the voice that, that narrates things. Yes. And it seemed to fit with, as you say, the, some of the material in these stories. I've, my daughter is now um, three and a half. My son is almost seven. And so the intensity of those early years um, of new motherhood and of the struggle to retain a sense of myself as a writer. Um, you know, you grow up, I think, especially as a woman with that image of the pram in the hallway, how it's going to devastate you, you're never going to write anything meaningful again. And I mean, we lack so many models of experience for motherhood and, and writers. Mm. I have friends who found that they have really struggled and they haven't been able to write again or write in the same way. Mm. But I felt this great joy that anything that makes you more vulnerable as a person, mm. I think, makes you a better writer. Anything that makes you care less what people think <laughs> um, makes you a better writer. Mm. And that was my experience of motherhood. Mm. And there's been something about the form, the urgent form of short stories that I've found able to, in between looking after children and, and I've looked after them, I've done most of the childcare in these early years, but I've been able to hold myself open enough for the sort of pitch or the duration of a short story. So the form of short stories has suited um, me very well in the last few years. And with my stories in multitudes, I told stories that I'd long wanted to tell of girlhood and young womanhood in Northern Ireland and Belfast. Um, I'm moving to London. And then, yeah, this has been the stuff of my life um, for, for the last few years. Right. And so it feels um, satisfying that Intimacies is now a sister volume to Multitudes. Yeah. Both are yeah. 11 stories. Um, yeah. They're coming out together in one volume in Poland, which really? I love because yeah. I think they belong together. Wow. Um, they're, they're, they're one project. Mm. Mm. And um, you mentioned that move to London and uh, I noticed a distinct difference between that first 
volume of stories and this subsequent one, mm -hmm. in terms of the content and the sense of place, in that it appears to have shifted somewhat more towards London with this collection. Would you like to say something about that? I think one of the things that I've really valued coming to the Irish Writers um, in London Summer School is that everyone who attends, writers, participants, and you um, have such a keen and nuanced sense of what it means to be Irish outside of Ireland or what it means to be of Irish heritage, um, maybe a generation or so remo removed. Mm -hmm. And those, that tangle, those nuances, those complexities of identity. Um, we've had such valuable discussions over the years about what that might mean mm -hmm. for a reader, what that might mean for a writer. And I have found at first, I struggled with writing Belfast from afar, and then I realised that I couldn't have written the Belfast of Multitudes if I'd still been living there. It could only have been written um, by my living away. But then the idea of writing London, you know, you think of the great London writers, and you think of, you know, Dickens, and you think of um, Monica Alley and her Brick Lane, and you think of Zadie Smith, and you think of all these brilliant writers who've written London, and you think, how on earth can I start writing this? But then, bit by bit, over the years of living here, I started to feel that I did have a London mm. that I could write, mm. and I did start to feel the way that I could write it. Yes. My London is quite often caught between Belfast mm. and London. Mm. Um, we've talked about my, you know, spaces in transit, my mm. spaces outside of time, you know, airport departure lounges, long car journeys, train mm. journeys, mm. Um, time somehow outside of itself. But in these stories, I started writing Shoreditch, and I started writing the East End, and I started writing, wanting to capture it for my own children as well. You know, my two children are both, um, <laughs> I think, technically Cockney, you know, born and registered in Stepney within earshot of Bow Bells. Um, they're growing up in London um, with a British passport, with Irish passport, I, with um, London accents. Uh, but I always wonder how Irish they will feel, how Irish they will feel entitled to be. And so in part, the stories that I've written here, and this volume dedicated to my daughter, um, Orla Rose, um, is capturing something of the London of her early years, mm. um, capturing some of that for her as well. Mm. And for those like her, the, the collection is dedicated to all London, especially Northern Irish. And that that's sometimes feels as cumbersome to live as it is to say, but that felt very important to me yeah. um, for those readers that I've discovered in part through, through the summer school. That was marvellous, Lucy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much for Thank you me. so much for joining Thank us. You. And thank you all for tuning in to this wonderful anniversary event to celebrate 25 years of the Irish Writers in London Summer School. We're going to finish with um, a reading from Martina Evans, our patron, and she's going to introduce that reading by saying a few words about the Summer School herself. Sometime in 1997, I walked down Holloway Road to London Metropolitan University where I had my first experience of the Irish Writers in London Summer School. It was a revelation, a social occasion, and it felt like coming home. Here was a thriving London literary community coming together to study, read closely and celebrate Irish writers. There were lots of creative writing summer schools at this time but none of them dedicated to the greatest and most important part of being a writer, becoming a good reader. Borges said that good readers are rarer than good writers, and it's true. Becoming a good reader is the work of a lifetime. Tony has put a lifetime of work into the summer school, and it really shows. Every time I visit, there's a burgeoning sense of confidence from the participants as they become increasingly skilled in their engagement. And if the summer school felt like home from the first moment, maybe it was because somehow I had a presentiment of how much it would come to mean to me. As a guest writer, I must have attended the summer school at least seven times. And in fact, one summer, I helped Tony run the seminars. So I've seen it from both sides. It takes a rare person to juggle all the aspects involved in keeping the school afloat for so long. And what makes the summer school unique are the Londoners who attend the school. They are keen and generous and have so much to offer, 
not least their tremendously varied life experiences. It's been a joy to come to such a safe place of learning and watch so many people blossom. And now I'm going to read a poem called London. Feverishly I return, always running from Ireland, and yellow brick calms me like green fields for others. Over Waterloo Bridge I go, hanging on to my hat in the wind, lights strung out on the water. The babble on the 76 of 77 languages, trundling to Dalston, where the Turks are polishing their pomegranates, and Joey and myself yap through the basement window over our mugs of blackstrap molasses. This afternoon, standing in the biting wind at Mile End, the electronic drone announcing 277 to Highbury Corner quickened me as if I'd come to a bend in the dark night and seen in a blaze the lights of home.